It is a real pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure to be here. My name is Rich Blint in the School of the Arts, Associate Director of the Office of Community Outreach and Education. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure and honor to be here to introduce this conversation between Bill T. Jones and Dean Carol Becker about his really fantastic book, Storytime, The Life of an Idea. Bill and Carol have been wanting to have this conversation for a long time, so it's really good that we have a public conversation here this evening. Um, before I proceed any further, I want to give a sense of how we're going to proceed this evening. Um, the conversation between Bill and Carol will take about 45 minutes with me intervening, hopefully productively, right? Um, but before we do all that, I'm going to invite Bill up here to, after I introduce them, to, to frame a clip from Storytime, the choreographed piece at New York Live Arts. But first, some introductions. Carol Becker, um, sitting right here, is Dean of a Faculty and Professor of the Arts at Columbia University School of the Arts. She was previously Dean of Faculty and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, as well as Professor of Liberal Arts at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She earned her PhD in English and American Literature from UC San Diego and has published widely, including The Invisible Drama, Woman and Anxiety of Change, which has been translated into seven languages, The Subversive Imagination, Artist, Society, and Social Responsibility, Zones of Contention, Essays in Art, Institutions, Gender and Anxiety, Surpassing the Spectacle, Global Transformations and Changing Politics of Art and Thinking in Place, um, and Thinking in Place, Art, Action, and Culture Production. A lot of work. She lectures extensively in the US and abroad and is the recipient of numerous awards. She also is a board member of the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Art in Society for the World Economic Forum. Her book, The Invisible Drama, was re reissued in paperback in 2014. Carol Becker. Um, the fantastic Bill T. Jones, artistic director, co-founder, and choreographer of the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company, and artistic director of New York Live Arts, is a recipient of numerous awards and honors. And you guys are going to bear with me for a second. The roster is really quite long, Bill. Very, this is a short bio, by the way. He has received the Doris Duke Artist Award 2014. And I'm telling you, bear with me. The National Medal of Arts 2013, the Kennedy Center Honors, the Jacobs Pillow Dance Award, a Tony for Best Choreography of the Musical Fella, all of that in 2010. He received a Tony and Obie and an Ellen Harris Norton Fellowship um, in 2007, as well as Stage Directors and Choreographers Foundation Callaway Award for his choreography of Spring Awakening in 2006. It continues. The Lucille Lortel Award in that same year, he has also won the Wexner Prize, the Samuel H. Scripps American Dance Festival Award for Lifetime Achievement, the Harlem Renaissance Award, the Dorothy and Lillian Gitch Prize, and of course, the 1994 MacArthur Genius Grant. In 2010, Mr. Jones was recognized, I'm going to say this in English, as the Officer of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French government, and in 2000, the Dance Heritage Coalition named him an irreplaceable dance treasure. Isn't that right? <laughs> But I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm sorry. Mr. Jones, Mr. Bill T. Jones, choreographed and performed worldwide with his par late partner, Arnie Zane, before becoming, forming the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company in 1982. He has created more than 140 works for his company and serves as the artistic director of New York Live Arts, an organization that strives to create a robust framework in support of the nation's dance and movement-based artists through new approaches to producing presenting and educating. Please join me in welcoming our guests. So b before we, you'll notice there's no tears for us to sit down in, right? This is not some funky dance moment here. The screen, as you can see, has been is carefully supported. And so before we have to go through a whole bunch of rearranging, Bill T. Jones will come up and frame the clip you're about to see. Thank you, Bill. Good evening. I feel like I should be singing Michael Jackson's I'm Bad, I'm Bad, right? <laughs> Why would you do that, Rick? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about that. What does it mean to be a stage whore? And um, wh what does it mean to be a stage whore who wants to be taken seriously as a thinker and a creator and a spiritual human being? 
So maybe we'll get to that later. Anyways, what you're about to see is um, one of the, uh, an excerpt from um, one of many, many variations on the idea of indeterminacy that I call story time. My uh, associate artistic director, Janet Wong, who is with my company tonight up in Albany at The Egg, um, she and I devised this thing where she went through 30 some years of the company's history and uh, took one, two, three minute sequences uh, things going back to early duets that I did with my now deceased co-founder, Arnie Zane. Um, things that were maybe done in a large piece like the Lincoln work that was done uh, oh, five years ago or so. Um, things that might have been in the class that day. And through random procedure, gives the dancers a menu. They literally, you see them sitting on the side of the stage because, you know, 70 minutes they have to memorize or somehow master 70 minutes of event. I have written a hundred and maybe 70 stories and I've collated uh, at least 10, 12 more from various sources. All the stories are informed by a kind of mischievous attention to uh, John Cage's very famous storytelling, laconic uh, oftentimes elliptical, oftentimes uh, ruminations on that which is not directly addressed but seen from right or left. John Cage was very interested in Eastern philosophy, as I have been, but maybe just as much uh, Eastern philosophy as the notion of being the son of a Southern Baptist mother. Uh, so you're going to see a, a little snippet of the performance. Everything, there's a clock in it, as I'm looking at the preset here, and it sort of explains itself. The piece is normally seven minutes, 70 minutes long, which means roughly 70 stories and 70 different sequences of movement connected through random.org. Unlike John Cage, who used the I Ching or tossing coins or dice, we now go to um, digital technology. And this is the result. Every performance is different. book if you haven't seen it and um, I'm going to start by uh, am I on now yes yeah. ah fantastic so I'm going to start by um, asking Bill about um, the nature of his relationship with John Cage because one of the things that was most surprising to me and maybe has been to others probably has been to others I have to figure out the um, ergonomics <laughs> of this situation um, has been to recognize how important Cage has been to you in your life. And the book has been, Bill calls the book a conflicted object and an experimental action. And all of these, um, these terms that we don't usually think about when we talk about books. And I think that's particularly interesting. But it is very much based on uh, the work of John Cage. Is that and true? Books are never conflicted? No, books, books are always conflicted, and writers are always conflicted, but, um, but they don't acknowledge it often. And what I felt with... You've already subverted my, my first question. We'll do that, <laughs> and they'll keep them on okay. their toes as okay. well. <laughs> um, but, all right, that's fine. But what, I, what was interesting to me was that you... you I think are conflicted about Cage, and you are very overt about that in the introduction. You're not hiding from it at all, uh, and you say that Thelma, Thelma Golden called you out and you know made you come out and say you know I'm conflicted about my relationship with Cage, but he's very important to me. But the notion that the book, not just your thoughts, but this actual object, would be a conflicted uh, a conflicted situation. Uh, experiential situation that that uh, most writers don't think about their books quite that way. Although I I only speak for myself, um, but it doesn't mean the ideas aren't conflictual, but the actual object for you. And I think that's an interesting thing for a performative person. And the fact that you've chosen to create this form with these ideas and put it into this form. But could, but will you talk first um, about this complexity with Cage because? Within that complexity of what Cage represents uh, are so many issues about what the avant-garde is, uh, what it means to uh, step away from the political with which you are so associated mm -hmm. in so many ways. There's a whole issue of class, 
which I think really goes also with the avant-garde. Where is one comfortable? Where does one feel resolved? So I would love to just well, um, have you talk about that. You know, that's why I love speaking to you. Can you hear me? I love speaking to you, Carol, because you're so smart. I would start by saying that um, being a, and I was just uh, poking around to see who you were by saying stage whore. Stage whore. What, what is the appropriate Stage response whore. here? <laughs> Stage whore. Stage whore. Stage whore. Stage whore. There's this thing that um, John Cage, he quotes a, a teacher of his, a Zen teacher who says, you do it once, you do it twice. Uh, it's interesting, you do it five, 10 times, and it gets boring. Now do it 25 times, and it becomes interesting. So I'm trying to demonstrate to you my thinking. The book is actually trying to perform thinking. Who is the book for? Very important in the generation of performers that I come from, and we all know what I'm talking about, identity politics. Who is receiving? Who is speaking? What do we expect that language to be? So my thinking over the years has been through the body, the body with maybe an over-stimulated mind. From the beginning on stage, I was talking and moving at the same time trying to dance in the way that I was informed by my, for, my postmodern forebears, Merce Cunningham, Trisha Brown, Judson Church Movement, many, many people, how to reconcile those ideas of purity of movement with something like my mother's prayers. And what does Cornel West call it? The prophetic tradition? Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure I got my mind completely around what he means by the prophetic tradition, but it has something to do with actually having something to say to a time, to a place. So writing down about indeterminacy and my feelings about a man who never wanted to be pinned down with any belief. He wanted to demonstrate constantly newness. And he was constantly challenging anything that declared itself precise and in, in, in a place. Dancing is very real. The body is very real. Martha Graham, the person that Merce Cunningham ran away from, she talks about dance as being, well, the foot is either pointed or is flexed. That's the, the, lot, the, the gospel of that generation of dance makers. You either are doing it or you're not. You can be ambiguous in words. You see me on stage, you see a person. You see my race, you see my gender. You know when I'm wobbling on my leg. You can see me breathing, you can see me move. And yet, uh, writers are able to work weeks and months and years. It's not about being spontaneous. You don't expect it. So it's a conflicted object because of an identity that I have taken on colliding with a set of beliefs and hopes, which is something about the intellectual life and maybe legacy. Why do you write it down? Why do you write it down? Now. Your introduction was very generous, and I've forgotten, other than to, the, to describe the, uh, oh, I, I guess, how many people here really know who John Cage is? Ooh, got a smart group, huh? <laughs> who doesn't have an idea at all? Uh-huh. Well, John Cage is probably, according to the likes of um, Stan Brackage, a very important independent filmmaker in the, in the 70s and 80s, he said that he thought that history, as it shook down, there would be two artists that would be really important from the 20th century. He said Andy Warhol and John Cage. 
Others have modified that to say Joseph Boys mm -hmm. and Andy Warhol. That's the European point of view. Andy Warhol, we know. We live in a consumer's culture, a manufacturing culture. The symbology is there, literally. It's stamped on our t-shirts, it's stamped on our psyches. Somebody has invented something that we consume, be it Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, what have you. <coughs> John Cage was trying to say something about the certainty in the world and how we could each reinvent every moment in a world that's ever more manufactured. That's why he is important to tonight's discussion. Where am I, the son of potato pickers? My mother, please, Lord, please cry and savior. Now, where did that cadence come from? You could probably go back to a country church in 1860 and have heard that, that refrain. But what she was allowed to do was, after she said that, come on into this house this morning. Bless my husband who is weak, my daughter who is pregnant, da 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 da. And she'd start very, very specific in the room. And then it would become about the, 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 the town. And then it would become about the government. Then it would become about her problems, existential problems. When my face has become like a looking glass and my bedroom is a public road and all turn their face from me. Please, Lord, please cry and save you. And you vamp. There's a form, but you vamp and you fill it with the stuff that is you that is in this moment. John Cage, Irish, Catholic, a man who came out as gay quite late in his life, a man who had a lot of doubts about his talent. You know the story about Schoenberg? Schoenberg was, uh, he wrote to some friend of his, those music theory people would probably know what I'm talking about, and he said, you know, the students here at UCLA are not very interesting. I only have one that I think might be interesting, <laughs> but he's not a composer. I think he's an inventor. And he was talking about John Cage. So he, oh, he never had a place to be. But we were taught that this is one of the best things that you can learn in the 20th century, late 20th century, mind you, because these experiments and determinants they were in 1950, somewhere between 56 and 58. Um, I'm born in 52. They were saying that if you want to make modern art, you've got to find a way to refresh constantly and throw out everything that you think you know. I'm a performer. I have written on my heart a certain way of being and thinking. I want to please people. That's the stage horror part of it. We go at this to win. They don't give a fuck about us. And if you're a black man in a world which is usually, at least where I came from, predominantly white, when you get on stage, there is a transaction going on. How do you do it on your terms? I used to joke and say, not joking, no, I didn't joke. I said the most important strategy I understood was to know when to take the shirt off. <laughs> to what effect, Phil? I, I'm waiting for them. <laughs> Because I don't think they know what to do with what I'm trying to do. Oh. Ain't no truth up here. There's only experience. That's what was attractive about performing. There ain't no truth up here, only experience, and there's only this moment. I'm too clever now, huh? <laughs> Let those two intellectuals okay. pull it back let in. Me, let right? me, let uh, <laughs> Yeah. When you saw Cage, so first of all, for, for those who may not know, uh, so much of Cage's Buddhist theory comes from Columbia because Suzuki was teaching here in the 50s. And he, Cage came up and went to all the Suzuki lectures and he brought with him Rauschenberg and he brought with he brought everybody. We brought Merce with him. Um, and um, later he brought Yoko Ono. So Columbia 
which um, uh, strangely is sort of this center, this uh, nexus of these ideas and very connected to Cage. Um, but, but talk a little bit about, you saw the performance, you talk about this in the book, you saw the performance in 92 at SUNY Purchase, you saw this Cage performance and you were- No, 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 no. I first saw Cage in the 1970s when I was a young freshman student at the State University of Sorry, New York at Binghamton. Sorry, 72, 72, 72. 72, okay. And, but, I, and I was describing this um, thing that he was doing with David Tudor and there right. was a boat and there was a young woman and I asked um, the, um, uh, the Cage Trust what that piece was, but he, it was, the, he had done an earlier piece where he had a cactus on a table, and he took a microphone, and through some sort of processes of sound generation, um, he would trace the cactus, and it changed the timbre. Uh, in other words, you were allowed to see form. That night, he was tracing a rowboat on his end and tracing a mildly embarrassed young woman. Um, I didn't know what I was seeing. I'm a theater major. I had no idea what this was. It was in the common room. It was not in the theater, except I knew that I, I was bored to death that night, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. And in the cinema department, Ken Jacobs, Larry Gottheim, um, Michael Snow, all these people came through. What, the, not the, what Jonas Makers called the poetic cinema of the time was saying the narrative was not the point. That modern filmmaking was about the perception of you in that moment. Here I am, oh, I think I understand it. I am having a hell of a time understanding what I'm seeing, but I am moved by it. That's when John Cage became a kind of a hero. But you, but you, one of the things you talk about is you talk about boredom, mm -hmm. that you were bored, yes. but you couldn't stop thinking about it. In this 70 minutes, I'm sure there are moments of, what's the term, Bjorn? Longueur, right? Mm -hmm. That it's almost, we, we were taught at that time that if the work was really good, there would be moments when you would have to fight to stay with it. Only work, now this is prejudice, bias, you know, that actually has, work, has been digested and manipulates you, keeps you constantly entertained. Real art, you got to come to it. So, boredom. But you and your work, I mean, Cage had an interesting relationship to audience. He didn't. Is that what you call interesting? Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, he didn't care if people threw tomatoes at him, he didn't care if people left. I mean, I, I don't know that he didn't care, mm -hmm. but he just kept going. Yes, he did. You know, he wasn't he trying to please. He was very brave. Yeah, and mm -hmm. kind of wild in this respect, mm -hmm. but there was a pedagogy in it because while that was happening, he was, he was somewhat educating people about what he was trying to achieve, which was he was trying to get them out of all of the delusional aspects of performance that, or the illusion that somehow they should be caught up and entertained, mm -hmm. but that something else could be happening, and it could be happening, and, and that was very connected for him with this Buddhist sense of nothingness and this, uh, this empty space that he was trying to create, yes. right? Mm -hmm. But in your work, you're, in some ways, the work is so fabulously not boring. You know, I mean, this indeterminacy. Oh, I have my clunkers as well. The, I can but, be but bored not, hell. But you don't, yeah, yeah, but, but there yeah. isn't a deliberate, you're not deliberately. Well, well, Carol, going. I love you, honey, but we got to slow okay, down, okay, okay. slow down. Because okay. you said a moment ago, because your work is very political. I don't know, how many artists in the room? Right? You gotta be really careful, don't you? Because you start out doing one thing, and if you've been in the game long enough, suddenly you have a sense of what you do because of what they said you do. So, this one, the French say, oh, you're an artiste engagé. Well, it sounds good, but the hell does it mean? And when I read the fine print, it means that art, the best art, is somehow the removed from the world. But you, black American, angry, HIV positive, homosexual, you're engaged in the world. I just thought I was doing my personal poetry. So what's the truth? So now I make this work because is this political? I know you know, you, I'm just messing with you, but <laughs> Look at I, 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 made this, I made this work for just that reason, to ask me 
of myself, could you step away from any comfortable definition you or they might have about what you do? Bill, let me interrupt for a second. I yeah. want to just piggyback and kind of, um, you began by evoking in song mm -hmm. that old Southern world, right? Which is of this world, not nothingness and avant-garde. And so how do you reconcile? Carol talking been, about another world. Well, yes, it's true. And, but if um, Carol and I have been talking about it for a long time now, getting ready for this conversation, right? Why Cage? Cage has this avant-garde sensibility that's not about the world in some way, right? And so as Carol was suggesting before, he cares about the audience, but it's not really a primary for him. It's not a priority. So how do you reconcile? How do you fit? How do you walk in both feet with the political that is your embodied self that you mentioned in the beginning of this conversation and something like Cage? Why Cage is what we're asking. Well, is there anyone? He's singular in that way, isn't he? Didn't he wasn't, I think he's one of the freest uh, of, of, of his generation. It's true. I, I think there's a reason why he and Pierre Boulez uh, fell out. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, when, what was that, that, the famous letter that Boulez said, you know, John, I'm paraphrasing. I followed you, but you know, a carrot in a blender is not music, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's when they stopped being friends, <laughs> right? Because John Cage was going that way, and Pierre Belez st still thought there was such a thing as authorship, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and Cage just, thought that Pierre Belez was caught in history, that he couldn't get beyond history. Oh, they had their little hissy yeah. fits, didn't they? Yeah, but, and then we can sort of enjoy it. You know, I don't know, I'm, I'm following you. I, I, there's something about Cage that moves me because I, I knew him somewhat. I even went out with him to dinner a couple of times. The man was um, all too human. Uh, I do know people who knew him intimately who said that when people did things like walked out, booed, whatever, or orchestras purposely tried to subvert his work because they didn't want to play it, that he was, he was hurt by it. Mm -hmm. And that when I understood that as an artist in my, I, I say, uh, my friend Kiki Smith said, so when they call us mid-career, what they mean is middle age, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When or you, older. Yeah, right. Or older, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> but, but he actually, when I got to my own middle age, I realized, oh my God, he was actually struggling for his own sense of purpose, uh, belief in what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I think he wanted, that's the big one, I think he wanted to be loved. Why do you say that? Hmm? Why do you say that? I knew him as a person. Mm -hmm. I, I knew maybe knowing myself in my most belligerent acts, oftentimes are gravely, it's about disappointment. My falling short, and will they ever understand me? Now, I'm being kind of, uh, I love you too, but I'm being a little pugnacious tonight because I want you to work <laughs> to love me. <laughs> all of us, right? I want you, all you motherfuckers, to work to love me. <laughs> but that's just punctuation, guys. You okay, know? I don't, didn't, don't, don't, I don't, didn't don't, really no. sign on for yeah, that. No, but, no, no, you no, no, no. No, you take your responsibility, you take yours, I'll take mine. All right, all right? baby, all right. That's all right. the game, isn't it? Carol? Right? What? what no, I, I was going to. me? No, I, I was going to ask you to follow up with some mm -hmm. of the questions we have right. that are relevant to this. So I'm interested in this idea of lineage. Like how one... Legacy or lineage? Lineage. How one, where, most artists I know, and working in all form, and intellectuals as well, position themselves, however consciously or not, in relationship to others who worked in those forms. And they, they um, take inspiration from them and courage from them. And so I guess that's what's interesting, is that you're putting yourself in, in a lineage an unexpected lineage, and that I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious. No, tell me now. Yeah. now this, is an, this is a jump. When Kahindi Wiley um, does history paintings using hip hop basketball stars in uh, as something in, in a composition that uh, Gary Cole or um, David Cole, yeah. or uh, any or even Goya, I mean, that, you know, he, mm -hmm. is he in their lineage? I think, I don't know that he would say that, but I, I, you know I'm, I'm, I guess I'm interested, I'm, I'm interested from the point of view of the artist. I don't really care about art historians in that way. But who, what's this lineage thing? 
I'm, I'm interested in how one, where one sees oneself, or, or who do you go to, who do you go to, to take strength, to move forward. Mm -hmm. So that's where the cage conversation, that's what I think, I thought the book was somewhat about. Indulge me. Putting yourself in. I got you. Okay. Indulge me though, right? There's the only way I can deal with the feelings I'm feeling right now and where, where we're at. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger out traveling through this world of woes. But there's no sick this toil or danger in that bright world. You know the rest. Now that's one position. This is a veil of sorrow. We're born and we die alone. You call out, I call out. The only thing that connects us is that we're born, we grow, and we will die. Now that's a lineage. It's a human, now, a human well, lineage. What else is there? Yeah. What else is there? There's mark making. Did I want to be in the New York School of Composers um, that John Cage represents? No, I was trying to understand, I think, in the way that Fred Wilson does, and maybe Ralph does, and the way any host of people does, uh, you know, I ain't supposed to be here. And I am going to try to just put myself someplace where I'm not supposed to be. Well, I've been trying to get happens. you to talk about that mm -hmm. since well, I started. Well, I've been talking since we started. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, let me, let me jump in here. <laughs> this is how a performer talks. <laughs> yes, we're going to wrangle you in just a little bit, though, Bill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, for everyone's sake and for our own sanity. Well, is there period. something you're not getting, folks? <laughs> no, they're fine. They're fine. Okay, they're okay. Fine, no, no, fine. I'm saying, I mean, what? what and they'll join the getting? conversation soon. So yeah, yeah. Let's just get through this exchange yeah. here. Um, <laughs> and so, Carol, I guess one way to get back. I'm here to be loved, remember? Are we all clear on that? He's yeah, here to be yeah. loved, right? Yeah. And we have love for him, yes? <laughs> it's not that easy. He wants you to work for it. It's not that easy. <laughs> Who's the man I'm married to? It's not that easy, right? So um, to get back to lineage, not legacy, I want to ask Carol a question, and then we'll get back to you in one second, Bill. Um, Carol, can you talk a little bit about lineage, maybe more straightforwardly than our friend here? Um, and the Frankfurt School, Marcuse, what Bill talks about in that book about his search, and Bill, you can chime in here after, his search for intellectual home. Think about how Marcuse and the Frankfurt School kind of give you a kind of intellectual lineage, a kind of orientation to the world. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. You know, I, I don't, I think everyone who's moving through the world now, so it's so complex. And whatever form anybody's working in, whether it's you know in movement or theater or every or or me just writing essays, um, we're trying to find a frame within which to talk about the complexity that we almost have no tools to deal with. And what I rely on daily is, I guess, several things. One is having had a chance in life to be around people who came out of such complicated situation like World War II, like the Holocaust, mm -hmm. you know, who had to leave and, um, and form you know, a whole ideological body of knowledge around those ideas and who b have become for me uh, a way of framing the world in what I would say is a um, position of negation. Mm -hmm. So whatever comes up in the world, whatever instant comes up, uh, I was trained not to take at face value, but to constantly look at it in a dialectical way, <laughs> to, to, to spin it and turn it and say, well, it looks this way, but what is it really, what's really happening? So, you know, thinking about Marcuse or anything like technology, you know, if you're, if you're someone uh, in Google or uh, you're in Microsoft or you're in the Bay Area right now and you're working in these professions, and you hear a conversation by those people, they truly believe, many of them, that technology will save us from everything. <laughs> they really do believe it, and it's a new utopic version of reality. Mm -hmm. At the same time that one could say, if one were looking at it in a different way, one could say, well, nothing's changed. Uh, that's a new tool, and we communicate in all these different ways, but in fact, it's created a whole new set of problems and a whole, a whole new set of inequities. So I guess, um, where some people have access, some people don't have access. You know, 
is it any different for um, a village in KwaZulu-Natal than it was uh, 30 years ago, pre-computers? No. People still don't have water, they don't have electricity. So my mind, I guess what all I'm trying to say is that my mind is trained to always constantly throw up whatever is put before it and look at the other side. And that comes out of studying a certain body of knowledge and with certain people who approached the world that way because the world had betrayed them in such an enormous way. And they had to try to make sense of that. So I guess that's, that's what I mean. When that's fantastic. And so what would be your intellectual home? You, you mentioned early in the introduction, you had the search for all the reasons you've already elaborated somewhat tonight. We have the search for intellectual home somehow did not fit in the school that you inherited. So talk, as Carol just did, maybe a little bit about that quest. And have you settled somewhere just now? Um, <laughs> is, that, is that really is that really what you? I'm asking? missing, but settled. yeah, well, not settled. Yeah. But I'm yeah. saying yeah. you 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 state very clearly in the opening page of that book um, mm -hmm. about a search, Bill. And I'm is that search not over? Certainly, but what is that quest? I, like? I think I, it's this this conversation is an example of what I am what I mean by search. Okay. Yeah. Where does the emphasis lie? No, Susan, get out of here. The uh, the where is the Truth in the moment. Capital now, T see, the, truth? Yeah, well, wherever you want to control it. I, I, see, I, I don't know if we're going to ever understand. You say you turn it. I, I'm, never, I'm never believing anything that any construction that I get, any analysis that I have. That's I'm never I, believing I'm it. I'm the right? same. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm the same. So then when do we stop trying? And when do we sort of go on what I call a kind of... Um, uh, a faith, or um, you feel it when you're actually doing something that you really want to be doing, and you spend your life looking for those moments. The rest of it is somehow there, it seems like public relations to me. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, literally, oh, he stands for this. This is what he does. It's like saying, this is my brand. You know, that's what the world has become more of, particularly yeah. in the art world. But we're not asking that, you know that. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if, if I can even be honestly say what I mean by my intellectual home. Where do I feel right? When I sing my mother's songs or when I sometimes say things and I try to connect with this lady who I know or your husband or that guy there with a the nice face and all of that, you know, when I, th that moment, I'm looking for those moments because that moment, ah, that was real. And then sometimes in a performer, you set up those moments to happen. Do I want to be um, a published author that sells thousands and thousands of books? I'd like the money, you know? <laughs> Do I want to make a piece that the New York Times declares a masterpiece? Do I want all the young students graduating from Columbia and Barnard to have to study what I do, right? To me, that's all about me, like kind of jerking off, isn't it? You know. You know? Well, it, I, it is. I don't know. It does it really make any difference? Okay. Yeah? I, I want to ask you something. I, I saw. I, I, I said this to you before, but I saw um, Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin right. in Chicago, 1990. Was it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It. It was the first thing I'd ever seen of yours, mm -hmm. and it was an experience of. <laughs> theater, performance, spectacle, intellectual investigation. I had never seen anything like it. And the reason that I was so completely taken with it was that you never let, it was so gloriously beautiful and then you'd stop it. You would just stop the whole thing and you'd be sitting next thing at a table having a conversation with some preacher who you found in Chicago or wherever you were arguing about religion. And sort of you, like what we're doing tonight. Sort of like this. And you were willing to break everything you'd created with the audience. All of that mm -hmm. fabulous moment that we were having, giving ourselves over to it, you s would stop it. And you were, f I thought it was fearless in, in the way that I didn't know if it would ever come back. Like, could you pull this thing back? So I, at that moment, I felt like I was seeing something I'd never seen before in a theatrical experience of any kind. Right. And, and I, so that's, to me, that's what you do. Well, that's what I was doing. And I thought that I was participating at that time mm -hmm. in an intellectual tradition 
I thought I was part of a lineage, Meredith Monk, Robert Wilson, Alvin Ailey. I thought, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I thought at that time that's what it meant. Right? But it had so much more content than some of these other artists, for well, me, uh, but at you the know time. What? I'm, I'm not even allowed to say that. Okay, well, you don't need to say it. Yeah. All right. L- you know, let's, let's talk about how it came about. Yeah. Arnie Zane and I were ambitious young dudes, and we were, had the ear of Harvey Lichtenstein. So every two years or so, we would go to him with an idea. Arnie was very sick. We went to Harvey with the idea. They wanted to do a piece that was going to be informed by an image of Jesse Norman, the great black soprano, suspended on an ice floe above the stage of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Now that would start it as an image. Now what was in that image? And then there was this idea of what was going on in Congress with Jesse Helms and Robert Maplethorpe and so on. And then there was this sense of guilt. Could sex kill you? Could too much freedom kill you? Now, we, Arnie was getting sick and dying. Harvey came in. We talked about this piece called Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin. That title already, Last Supper, my mother, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the, ba- the book that you, nobody wants to be called an Uncle Tom. Why not? They're going to be put together. Let's just cram them together. Arnie was dying. Let's talk to a priest. Let's, let's talk to a person of faith and ask them, is AIDS punishment from God? In front of an audience full of people, that's not a church. Let's have a conversation where we know the country, part of the country was saying, you dudes are getting everything you deserve. And I wanted somebody to sit on stage who had authority and say, yes, you are, you homosexuals are dying because you sin. Let's let's take off the gloves. Let's not do this intellectual thing. That's what it was. It was actually a whole series of provocations to myself, Mm -hmm. and it was going to be public. I was working with a radical lesbian socialist psychotherapist who said that to, and Frida Rosen, may her name long be said, right? She said that she was not interested in therapy as a story in Jungian or, or, or Freudian. She said that she was interested in making changers, catalysts. That's what therapy was about, to teach you how to engage the world. It's your neuroses should not, maybe people regret it now, but your neuroses is not something that you hold inside of you and you turn over, but your, your neuroses should be, in fact, socialized. Go out and talk about your problems with being a black man that does not know how to balance his checkbook and your lover is a white Jewish man who does, right? <laughs> well, what's funny? It's yeah. dead serious. <laughs> it's dead you know? serious. It's dead serious. And what, no, what I'm saying is that's what the work was. Yeah. Now you remember it, and you're, and you're a great mind, and you remember it. And I'm so pleased that you remember it that way. All I remember is the meteor shower at that time, <laughs> which was, you're only as good as your last performance. You're only as good as the last critique. And you're throwing these things out that can, and my mother says, son, every night you're asking that man the same question. This is every night we interviewed a person of, of uh, faith, and my mother toured with me. She said, every night you're asking the same question. I thought it was pure inquiry. And uh, she said, when are you going to get the right answer? <laughs> so there, there was no, how does Ornette Coleman say, the idea has no destination? That's what it was, Carol. Now, what is it now? It's a wonderful memory in your mind. And, and a few other people. But not just that. It's not just that. It's not just that. I mean... Well, they teach it. It's true. There's a videotape. No, that teach it. it's, it's bigger than that. It's, mm-hmm. it, it is, for me, maybe selfishly, a representation of the potential of the function art can serve in the world. It really is that for me. Okay, yeah, and I yeah, write yeah. about things like that. Yeah. So I need moments like that. Because if I don't get moments like that, I don't have anything to write about because I don't know how to talk about how you manifest an idea in a way that is beyond the idea, beyond the intellectual, beyond the mind, that, inc- that actually moves an entire psyche to see the world in a different way. That is the potential of what art can do, but it rarely achieves it. Rarely. Do you think, you think not? I, I think it's rare that it mm-hmm. achieves it. Absolutely. Because, yeah. it's, it, because most things fit into categories that exist, or they fit, they don't interpenetrate form 
in such a way that they can exist on the boundaries of that form. They are predictable. Mm -hmm. And once something becomes predictable, it can't unnerve you. It can't unseat expectation. Because... Well. Hallelujah. So, Hallelujah. But, what can I say? If they, but you don't if have to say our, anything, a, but you're, ask, you're, you're yeah. asking, you're saying yeah. to me, to me, it's more meaningful. It's beyond you. And, in, 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 mm -hmm. you know, you just are here. So I'm saying it to you, but it, it's beyond you. It, it lives in this bigger universe of things which are representative that way. And it came through you. Mm. You know, I, I and a whole community of people and a particular yeah, time. Yeah, it's like D. H. Lawrence says, yeah. not, not me, but the wind that blows through me. You know, it came mm -hmm. through you. So I'm not even attaching it to you. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that. I'm proud to have be connected with it. Good. I am. I am proud. I don't know really what to do with it. You don't need point. to do anything. Yeah. We were talking earlier mm -hmm. about performance art, and performance art. We were talking about this thing about breaking form and what mm. what do you, what is that? And could you talk? Could you define per, what performance art is? I, I don't. I, I don't want to define it. I wouldn't define it, but uh, because I think that's the fluidity of a category mm -hmm. that gives people room to you. You use the you use the term spectacle or entertainment spectacle. I mean, that's when you one isn't quite sure exactly what to do with something. You give it this other world, and I think performance art. People have these banal associations because there was a lot of bad work that came out for a very long time and I was a dean of an art school and I saw it, believe me. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was one of those moments when you just wanted um, people wrapping themselves in tape and, you know, there were horrible things going on and they were going on repeatedly. In this, they weren't interesting. But then out of that came some very interesting things because people were, were able to break through form and that opened a lot of uh, space for other things to exist and didn't have to be categorized, which is so kills art, I think. And in a way, to get back to story time, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I was trying to break through form. I was trying to break through what I had learned, what I knew, and I wanted to do something that I almost didn't have control of and maybe something would be born that I, I was not. Because I, I feel like, in a way, they, the spiritual buttons that are inside are going off. It sounds like a person's creed you just spoke. Um, that your excitement is, there's a whole world view that you believe that an act that a person can do can actually penetrate deeply into the human experience in the way that religion does sometimes. And I think that I'm feeling that right now as I think about what, I, what the spiritual home is. Mm -hmm. I guess I want to feel um, the solace that I think people who really believe in God, mm -hmm. I want to be able to feel that solace. But Bill, let me go back for one second really quickly to this idea. Um, Cage for me and for Carol, I think, conjures formal questions, right? So you mentioned in the book that somehow story time, the piece you guys saw, um, well, you saw six minutes six out of minutes 70. Of 70 minutes, yes, mm -hmm. occasioned what you call a kind of respite. Mm -hmm. a kind of infinite adaptability, right? To Carol's question about performance art. And so what's the relationship between um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, its concern with narrative or separation between narrative and abstraction, and what you're doing here with Cage? What does it mean to have a, how is story time for you a refuge, a respite, a place of infinite adaptability? And that to me signals um, this idea of performance art. So how does that I turn I think out? I had a stronger belief in the power under the influence of Frida of community than I do now. Okay. I think that I went down the rabbit hole of lonely auteur um, because I got, I don't, for whatever reason, out there like that, almost preaching. Okay. How do you get people in these towns? I want you to come join us and be on stage at the end, 60, uh, 52 people from your community all of us naked and singing together because right now we've got to show that we're not afraid. Yeah. That's what I was doing at that point. We can, be, we can push back against the forces of conservatism. We can push back against our own, uh, literally that bit when you are no longer able to give blood because your blood is contaminated. That was a big psychic break from the world. So that piece was actually me fighting for my place in the human race. Mm -hmm. I really believed it. And people came out. People uh, that Jesse Helms was there waving the book, but there were people 
common conservative people who wanted to stand naked on stage in their towns because they believed in freedom. Da 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 da. When story time. I'm now I've got by that time I have two Tony Awards. I have. Um, has I had received the Kennedy Center at that point, the MacArthur, mm -hmm. all those things you read, you know? And why make another work? Why make another work? Well, this is what you've always done. Why make another work? So I thought, well, you know what? Maybe others have been here before, and let's look at your mentor, um, look at John Cage. As I understand, he had a kind of a breakdown that led him to go to indeterminacy because he felt that his work was not actually addressing the, the things that were big in the world, the Cold War. He felt that he was not really getting to that place, and so he needed another way to do it. I said, well, why don't you well, try, try what he's saying? You know, why don't you try it? And at the same time, you can get in a few rabbit punches, you know, uh, because you're really hurt by those guys, those, uh, those uh, smart white artists right, who don't have your problems, you know. There's a whole series of, of dances that I do when I'm really, really happy, and I, I finish a program, it's called The Sweet Impediment to Greatness. Mm. <laughs> and what it is, is I put on music that feels really good and I dance. Because, you know, it's sweet, and some of my beautiful dances, but you know what, the real people who know, they can see that you know, it's so easy, it's so facile, they could take it apart, and whatever. But at that moment, I'm gonna say, hey, it's not great, but it feels good. You wanna have some? <laughs> so that is a piece called The Sweet Impediment to Greatness, which is a string of improvisations, where uh, the story time person is also trying to understand that. Bill T. Jones writing stories of different temperature, right? Let me, let me read the one about my mother. I want you to read that. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe we need to. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. This is, this is, is this the one? Story. Yeah. Well, and um, this is an example of something when I say I'm going to use indeterminate means to talk about maximal emotions, mm -hmm. right? My mother, Estella, died in the fall of, of 2002. Though she was to be buried near her mother, Anna, in the small town of Bonnell, Florida, the funeral service was held in Tampa. The service was the culmination of a week of grieving outbursts, negotiations, hurt feelings, and certainly laughter. However, when the minister, after a moving though perfunctory eulogy, said to us as Stella's children, y'all come say goodbye to your mama, everything changed. 10 out of 12 of us were present, standing around the open coffin. I was sure this would be a purely public formality, even as I heard the low murmur of my siblings addressing our mother, each in a private voice. These quiet calls took on urgency close to hysteria as the coffin's lid was slowly closing. Some even tried to stop it. I felt secure in the role of observer until the wailing was joined by one more voice crying, pleading for more time to look, to touch. It was my voice. Now there's, set, there's numerous stories with that kind of fragmentation. I don't need a, a novel to explain them. Story time allows me to drop them in, and you see the nature of the movement. Mm -hmm. And then you, the audience, deals with it. Have I moved the world? You and I have a moment. I think that uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin wanted to move the world. Mm. Carol, one last question from you before we turn it over to the audience. I was just thinking about, I think we both I think you do really admire Hannah Arendt. And, yes, I do. And thinking. And mm -hmm. I, I just, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, um, I always go back to the notion that thought is action. Mm. I just thought of, wonder what you think about that. But I, I go back to that a lot because. It's the same thing as saying, uh, as when I say art making is participation in the world of ideas? Maybe. Or art does for me what religion tr traditionally did. It organizes a seemingly chaotic universe. Maybe, but I, I, it's this. I think that her thinking is that you, you have, to, in a way, you have to have the thought to move anything. That I, that that action begins in ideas, mm. and for for you, you even talk about in I've in various things I've read that you've written or interviews 
that even when work has been abstract for you, there was a story behind it. It seems like there's always been a there, story. There's a strong feeling behind it. Uh-huh. And some narrative, some thought, yeah. some, mm. even in the most abstract moment. But, but anyway, I was just curious what you thought about that. Um, but we could end our part with, um, you know, the Paul Chan, artist Paul Chan, visual artist, you know Paul, I think. He has a wonderful book of writing out. And he says, art is and has been many things. For art to become art now, it must feel perfectly at home nowhere. So I just was curious what you thought about that. Well, it feels like this very kind of um, well-meaning discussion tonight has been an example of that. It's really been hard to get traction, hasn't it? And yet there's been some moments of truth in it. And I feel closer to you and at the same time further apart. Um, I'm not sure how the reviews will be tonight over a glass of wine after it's over. I certainly would like to be able to control those things, but I never can. <laughs> so uh, that's what I mean. That's exactly what he's talking about. You well, know? put it another way, Bill. Bill um, James well, Baldwin. We'll put it another way. You or her or me? Well, pause, <laughs> pause. Yeah. Put it another way. Um, because we're, we're, we've scripted this, and you're intervening um, in, in useful ways, in useful ways. See, I never uh, saw the script before we came in No, tonight. he's not I, meant to, no. Yeah, yeah. We um, have not been on script. At all, at all, at all, at all. But it's been a productive conversation. Um, but Bill, I have a question for you um, to echo Carol's concerns. Um, James Baldwin said at the Community Church in New York in 1963 in a piece called The Artist's Struggle for Integrity. Mm. Um, you mentioned the church before. He says... In order to get to the planet and survive it, we need artists. He says, statesmen can't do it, politicians can't do it, hymns can't do it, the church cannot do it. Only artists can tell the story of how we got here, down here below, quote Abby Lincoln again, and survive this place. Mm. What do you think about that? Is it, is the, what's the role of the artist now? We just had Walter <laughs> Scott gunned down. We saw what happened wow. in... Garissa University. Mm -hmm. um, we, me and Carol and I have been talking about the contractions in the globe right now. What's the role of the artist in contemporary society? And tomorrow morning, a guy is calling, and he's going to, Bill's going to do an interview tomorrow he's never done. I want five things that the arts do, what is it, for social, political, da 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 da. That's, I, that's my assignment tomorrow. He's already told me that he's going, he wants five tangible <laughs> examples. I just want an answer. What, I just want, what, I just yeah, want an answer. Well, well, it almost feels like the same thing. Uh, well, no. no, 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 it's fair, Rich. It's fair, it's fair, it's fair, it's fair. Today, walking from my last me meeting, discussing another production of West Side Story, walking past Parsons, and I saw uh, them doing the thing that universities do, trying to you know, drum up business about young people coming there and get your degree. And I said, <laughs> damn, you know, I mean, why are they it's turning out more artists? What, what, do we need more artists, you know? And then I thought, you know, like, calm down, calm down. This is like a crusty middle-aged middle man. You get kind of less than generous. Then I thought, well, think of art making as something like the digestive system. And the food is human experience. So you need these, if you want to say they are the chewers or are they the microbes, that's what artists are. They break the human experience down so that this nutrient, which is, what do you call it, civilization, um, whatever, what James Baldwin was getting at, that's the artist's job. And that doesn't, and I thought, can't the world get enough artists? Well, no, you, you have to eat every day, you have to digest every day, so every generation will need that again and again and again. Absolutely. So art schools keep pumping them out. <laughs> You know, <laughs> because we need them, right? I mean, do I sound a little cynical around it? No, and the no. tuition pays for some bills, yes. Yes, 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 yes. But I, I, I you know, this is, this is the man you, that has, that's an advocate who says, I go and I say, I said it to Bill, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bill Maher. The arts are as important as highways and hospitals. Sounds good, right? It's true. Yeah. Well, I have to reinvent my response to that. Because sometimes, I don't know if it's, I don't know what the arts mean in the face of ISIS. Yeah. I don't know what the art means in the face of that. You got, you know, the man running for his life and the man being shot in the back, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, people used to make fun of art, 
or engaged art like mine. So racism, war, you're against all those things. Well, what makes you think anybody is for war? What can you possibly say of anti-war that I haven't already heard, hasn't already been said? So why are you going to give your life to saying again, war is bad, war is bad? This is the other voice. Yeah. Artists also are on this sort of uh, quixotic journey, you know? A little more humility, a little bit more, focus it a little bit more, you know? How can I, um, how can I, I don't know, a little bit more humility, okay. yeah. Should we open it up for, you guys want to join the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, there's a microphone right there. Um, Where? We don't right. want, you want someone to have to come up. Could, no. No, no. Okay. You can, can you project? We're recording this. I thought we might need some amplification. Probably not. Okay. It, do we need to pass the mic? Uh, we can if you want, but... Uh, we, we don't have to if, you, if it's okay. okay. Go ahead. I'd love for you to speak. First of all, thank you for everything that you've given us down through the years. And I'd love for you to speak a little more about this idea of fragmentation, particularly in light of Ferguson, in light of Eric Garner, in light of Trayvon Martin. Um, how are we going to break these stale, cyclical conversations about race? Uh, <laughs> in terms of art, you know, I tend, I, you know, you hate to use labels, but I tend to refer to myself uh, mm. as a collagist, someone. You're, who, you're an artist? I'm, I'm an artist, a uh, performance artist. Yes, ma'am. Did all, everyone hear the, the ladies' questions? You, you, you're asking a very, yes. uh, how, how, well, you know, um, I, the glib thing is, well, how are you doing it, dear? You know, that's it. And Toni Morrison said to me once, you know, you know, you know, when you get positioned like that, people ask me questions, they should be asking anthropologists. <laughs> so, my sister, are you doing that? Well, I'm looking for ways to break what and how we see. Because I think mm. as long as we keep seeing the, in the same way and, um, and not disrupting mm -hmm. that, we're not going to come up with any solutions, any viable solutions. You, well, you're, you're speaking to, as I said before, a stage whore. Yeah. What I understood early on is you've got to understand how to get them when they don't know they're being got. <laughs> and then you've got to know how to do it with a smile. You've got to feed the fantasy machine. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to give rabbit punches <laughs> to their certainties. And then you've got to go home not knowing if it made any difference. Now, can you get an army of Columbia graduate students and Parsons, and they're gonna to get together and they're gonna to think of a work that is so powerful, using social media, that it's going to change the next election? How are we doing with that? Is, is moveon.org answering this question with a group of artists? See, it's too big a question in a way. You know, it's too big. You know, all I can do at this moment, if we had more time, is more singing, and I dance up the aisle. And then you say, wow, that was very beautiful. Or not. All I know is jump off the edge every moment, which I'm trying to do in this conversation tonight. Mm -hmm. Try to, dis to demonstrate disruption. Yeah. Now, see, I gave away my game, right? Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't have given away my game, huh? <laughs> Will you respect me more? A provocateur. Any other questions? And he does this. You see that? He put a nice little label on what it is. Well, baby, you said it before, <laughs> huh? And I said, we said it outside. Um, a question right here. Hey. The lady saw me being interviewed by Thelma Goldman about 12 years ago at the Studio Museum. She's a great lady, wonderful. Uh, you seem very different now than you did then. Are you different from yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> it's not just us, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what is that? You seem really difficult, different now, right? How do you think you've changed as a person in the last 10 years? How you changed? All right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a callus on my heart and I'm working every day to soften it. A follow-up? 
<laughs> That's his, this is his deal, right? Right? I'm trying to thread the conversation. No, and you're doing a brilliant job. That's why you're here. That's why. That's the only reason why I'm here. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Go I for it. I love you Murphy. too, Bill. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. it, so is it the cows is small, you know, like a quarter size? Oh, I don't know about the size. It just hurts. It hurts. What cost that cow? Hmm. Doubt. Is there any other? I knew that was coming, my God. Mm -hmm. You know, that, yeah, all of the above. I think, I think it's true. And you know what the uh, one thing that has happened, though, is I got married in, Ju in July, right? I have, um, I'm now artistic director of a space that has to deal with not only my work, but other artists' work. I'm a custodian there. I have to build a board for an art form that has many people scratching their eyes, scratching their head and wondering if they can get, I have to care again. Because I can't live with myself as a bullshit artist. I can't live cynically. <coughs> now, I gotta really scare myself regularly to know mm -hmm. I'm alive. That's changed. Will I make it? You know, will I make it? I don't know. And then I have to do it publicly. So my bros here, right? I have to do it publicly. And you better do it, you better be, you better be up to it. You better be ready if you're gonna get out in public because they are watching. They are writing it down. And they will remind you what you said and how inconsistent you were. <laughs> Carol, you have a question? You seem like you wanna say something, no? No, I'm curious what the audience thinks, actually. Other questions, comments? Let's see what people want to ask. So when you had your hand up like that, it was not a question? Are you doing performance back there? What's going on? I've invaded your space, right? Deborah has a question. Yes, what's that? The lady and I had a moment before because we were talking and I, she did this and she had three fingers. And I thought, was she keeping time? And then I thought, well, let's test it. So I did this. She looked at me. And then she, as my mom would say, she cracked a smile. <laughs> and in the midst of this conversation, that thing happened, right? That thing happened. Deborah, Deborah you had a question. You turn cage, uh, cage or merse? Um, cage. 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 Right, right. The idea of space, I, in the book, I say it is a um, poker faced plundering. Right? A poker faced plundering. Um, and I do think the ideas are strong. I think um, when somebody can get past Bill's personality or this particular story, I mean, I love the fact that Carol loved that story, but it makes me think, ah, you failed. Because what Cage was doing was, it was supposed to be, in some ways he was a leveler. The heart-rending story and the kind of a dry acerbic story, in a way, in this indeterminacy, were all the same level because he wanted you to get out of the habit of needing climaxes and, and hits of salt and sugar, right? But you, but you do both in your text. Well, but, but, but when I read that one out of, out of context, it's designed to get, to get a, a feeling and for me to have a feeling. But it's an unexpected story. Oh, okay, it's okay. Well, I, I, I'm saying that I'm, when the piece is going, and I think story time does this, people do have to get past, do I listen or do I watch? Mm -hmm. And they do this thing which people tell me suddenly a word and a movement have a kind of synchronicity and they have a, an acknowledgement and something happened. Now I think he was going for that. Sometimes that happens. And you know, in the studio we need chance, uh, we need indeterminacy in the studio. Because sometimes you, you, you puzzle over what color, what step next. Cage says, you know, just get out of the way. Doesn't matter, you throw pro coins. 
something gets done and that something will make something else happen. That's why he's so valuable in the studio. Now, in the artistic experience, not so sure. My next work is based on his, my friend's mother, 95-year-old Jewish woman, um, oral history, talking about her years during the war in the, in the, the uh, 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 in the Vichy government. She was working at two uh, holding camps, Gers, which was the last place that uh, uh, Hannah Arendt left from, and Rebsalt. And now I have really tried to take her story, break it down, my dancers say it, and we've choreographed in, a, in an abstract way with it. That I have a feeling about. That I want to go from here to there. But this, I didn't know what to think. Now I'm going back to where I really feel comfortable. Bill, a quick question. Um, you referenced before that the question that was asked early on was a bit big, right? So I guess I want to ask a really concrete question between the relationship between your dance practice and what you do with Live Ideas Festival, but also today Broadway World announced that you're doing this thing called Post-White America. Can art de-racialize the nation? New York Live Arts, an open Well, that's spectrum. good that you mentioned. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes. Yeah, so like for me, so here's a concrete thing with folks that we all know on these panels. It will span the course of three months, and Live Ideas begins next week with Laurie Anderson. Mm -hmm. We did it together last year with, yes. with, with James, James Baldwin, mm -hmm. incredible, which was in the world, right? So mm -hmm. the kind of elusive, abstract way you've been proceeding this evening. And then has, it been, has it been abstract? I mean, it's been legible to me. What I'm asking is that in, your response to the lady right here was like it was too big. But here you are from Baldwin to Anderson. No, she's asking how do you, how do you deal with I'm, Ferguson, yes. how, all those things. But you're, you're also, we, we discussed this mm -hmm. last year in your live arts, but in this stuff called post-white American art de-racialize the nation, it seems akin, an echo. <coughs> let, let, me tell you a little, let me tell you a little story in the time we have. Okay. Last spring or something, I was doing a series of what I call Bill Chats, which yes. is Bill calling people together to talk about things. That, and I talked about uh, the downtown. Mm -hmm. When did this idea of the downtown come about? The downtown avant-garde. Yeah, because yeah. that's a term that people throw out all the time, and it was really driving me crazy. You know, It felt very smug and insular. And then there was something about um, how, how it, was a, it was a real estate transition transaction. Why is that downtown that happened in lower Manhattan? Lord knows. I'm sure people want to do it here in Harlem. But why didn't they? That, that was the question. Then there was one about the last one that was so inflammatory because I handled it. Now, I don't think I handled it as well. I asked this question, when did the avant-garde become black? Now we can talk about that. But when I started in this field, when I was in an audience at the kitchen or wherever, I'd, well, in, the, in a performance, I'd be the only per black on stage, and maybe there'd be one or two, and I was sort of thought, this is just the way it is. <clears throat> so I said, but when did it suddenly happen that now it's sort of cool that we can all, we're all down with what we mean by black now, right? What, when did that happen? I think I was part of it. But a lot of the people that are even saying it now don't remember that I was doing it. You know what my friends said at Uncle Tom's Cabin? My hip downtown friends? You know, man, what's, what, you, you seem so upset. You know, what, what, what is this about? <laughs> that same old canard? Well, you know, I'm saying, they, and I thought I had failed because I hadn't educated them. They had, I was trying to be John Cage. I wasn't talking as a black person, right? So uh, this is what this talk was, but it turned into a very ugly, I don't know if it was ugly, my friend tells me it wasn't ugly, People were really angry because they said that I was rude. I said, at one point, Charmaine Jefferson said, well, let's, let's, let's be funky tonight. And I said, God, well, you know, it would be only my hope that the room could be funky. Because it was so polite, so <laughs> scripted, so art world, so educated. And I thought, the stuff is messy. And then you know what happened? That was a spring. Somebody wrote, a, a journalist said, you know, that he was rude and he's, and he's overbearing. It was too much of him, him, him. And I was just trying to get that cool room, cool like you are. Oh, to, they're funky to here. They're funky. I, I'm sure they are. But ain't no room. There's no way to be funky here tonight. Which is what I, what, there's, 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 we didn't set it up that way to be funky. It's not. And I was saying in that room that was full of artists, let's get dirty. There was a time when there was no black people. 
and nobody seemed to pay attention. And then suddenly the summer happened and there was Ferguson. Yeah. Then there was Eric Garner and everyone was wringing hands and, da, 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 and, every, and my young dancers, some of them black, like in black and middle class, they were, people were in the street, they were crying in rehearsal. You know, black lives do matter, you know, like this. I said, you ever hear Uncle Tom's cabin? You know, did, did you know that I was above the fold talking about these things back there? Did you know that? And I was told, accused of grandstanding and divisiveness, right? Did you know that? But no, we should do that. Your generation is not leading us. But that, this is the same, my company, not my company, but New York Live Arts, there had been this feeling that Bill had been overwhelming, over taking over the conversation and pushing this idea. Why is it so important to say there's a we? I was trying to get the black people in the room to say there's a we. I had young black dudes say, why is that so important, man? We, that was this, 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 why? And I think, so suddenly, Bill, you got a problem. You're race, you've been scarred by racism, you're stuck back in the 60s, you're confrontational, and then Eric Garner and Ferguson and blah, 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 blah. So the dancers are like, what, why don't we make a statement here at New York Live Arts? I said, okay, well, since people don't want to talk about race here, we got it all together here. We don't have problems with it. Maybe we should write an essay for the New York Times and say to the, the powers that be, we figured out in the art world how people can all live past, we, we got the diversity thing. Well, well, let's not go that far. <laughs> we should do public talks, but you should not be dominating them. We should do a series of talks because as people tell me, Bill, that question you were asking people, you need nine hours, you know, a week of panels. That was too rushed. It was too, you know, too abrasive. So we should do it in three talks. And each one will gradually take up one aspect of it. This is the third one. Okay. And what's the name of it again? The name of it is... <laughs> Guys, work with me, please. Um... <laughs> Post-white America can art deracialize the nation. It's the third one in the and, course of three months. And right? there will be a panel. There will not be just Bill up there with a group of people and him being provocative as I've been tonight. He's it will always be, like It this. will be scripted. People will say measured and meaningful things about it. Will they get funky? <laughs> <laughs> funky is expensive. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> People can get hurt feelings. <laughs> Supporters can walk away. You know, the wrong idea could be said by the ill-chosen words. Absolutely. You know? you know, being funky is what artists do, right? Stage whores do, you know? Being funky is that for groups of people to do without a script. I'm scared of it. Mm -hmm. So we shall see, and unfortunately, that one I'm going. I, that last one I cannot be at, right? Can you believe it? That's one I was looking forward to the most. So this started with last spring, and then the summer. Ferguson, we're still there trying to work through it and answer your question, but we're going to answer it in a way that would be suitable at Columbia, <laughs> responsible, <laughs> measured, you know. We sound so stained, Carol, don't we? Um, Carol, she's seen it all. She knows, she knows what I'm Carol, talking about. Carol, any closing right? remarks before we... Sometimes you want to howl, yeah. right? I'm, yeah. so, I'm so sorry, we've approached the end of the evening. Oh, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> what do you mean about sometimes you want to howl? All the time. We, you know what she means by that. No, 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 but I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, right now, what do we mean? We want to howl. You know, make, you're an artist. Make me want to howl. You know, make, you are, an artist goes in and they make something and that's their voice. Now do that on mass. Do that on mass. Howl. That's scary when people are howling on mass. I don't want to be around it because people are crazy. People are mean. People are self-invested. Can you trust people? Well, you came up now, sir. You're back with us, right? Yeah? <laughs> yes, it's you. Bill, we got to run out of here. Yes. Okay? So we get, please join me in oh. thanking Bill T. Jones and Carol Becker. <laughs> and, 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 and there are...
There are books outside for sale, story time, life and idea. Thank you so much for coming.